Let's change the world together. Welcome to the Snapcast, the podcast for all nonprofit professionals, bringing you interviews and amazing ideas for nonprofit leaders. This is Mickey Desai, and welcome to the Nonprofit Snapcast. Today, I'm lucky to have with me David Summerfleck, who is a digital marketing specialist out in my old stomping grounds of Denver, Colorado. David has done a, a lot of stuff in the digital marketing world uh, since the internet basically was web version one. Am I right, David? Yes, that's correct. And yeah. you've you've got quite a, a, quite a resume, if I'm reading things correctly. Are there any highlights that stand out to you amongst your history? Um, I mean, there's really not a single one that is the best. It's more of a cumulative effect. Mm -hmm. You know, of of all the years and basically since the mid 90s to the present, so much that I I learned and accumulated. Um, I was a business mentor for SCORE, which is a a well-known division of the United States Small Business Administration. I was a mentor for small business owners for approximately 10 years off and on while I was working for different agencies and until the point where I'm at now where I'm kind of semi-retired and I've tried to focus more on writing and kind of slowing things down a little bit. Mm-hmm. What kinds of things are you writing about? I'm working on a book uh, actually about digital marketing, big surprise, um, <laughs> basically to try to break down digital marketing and talk about it from the perspective of, I've noticed so many people tend to focus on price over value on tools over objectives. So I wanted to write something that would have almost min- very minimal technical jargon, but would focus more on, you know, let's put things in the right perspective and in, in the right order in order to achieve what we want. Mm-hmm. Nobody wakes up in the middle of the night thinking, I need a website so, you know, it'll solve all my problems. They wake up in the middle of the night saying, I can't pay my mortgage. I can't pay my rent. My nonprofit organization can't get sufficient donors. We're going to go under. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the book and basically what I do, what I'm most passionate about is trying to get people to look at this in terms of let's solve problems and not talk about plugins and widgets and apps and, and you know, how much can I get this for? Why is my free Wix website not delivering the phone calls I thought it would? Well, it's not meant to do that. Mm-hmm. So I want to kind of change the discourse to talking about value and achieving real tangible objectives for a nonprofit you need to get more donors you need money and it's a profound disconnect that i see in a lot of new startups in a lot of new uh nonprofit entities you know well, we don't really need money or it's just we want to help people and that's gold and that's beautiful but i've been there and i started a nonprofit like that and it lasted about three years mm-hmm. and it was just stress and anguish because I didn't put things in the right order. I had a beautiful custom website. I was number one in Google for what I was doing locally, Mm -hmm. but I didn't have the offline connections. I didn't have the connections with the court systems that I needed. So even though I was ready to rock and roll, it was just one phone call every, every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Just not enough to sustain any business. So that that's what the book is about, which is a mm-hmm. long-winded answer. So I'm just trying to be quick about it. Sure. No, and I think lessons being learned, I think that's a good segue into the topic I thought we would, would cover today, which is which is what does the average nonprofit need to know about how to how to properly do digital marketing? Oh boy. Uh without getting into real specifics and talking tech. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which really isn't relevant, you know, um, what the nonprofit needs to know is that first of all, it's a process, not an item. And that may seem like a no brainer to some people listening or to yourself. It may seem like, you know, Hey, no kidding. But that's usually the dialogue starts at how much is a website? How much is SEO? How much is e-commerce? I can properly accept donations. How much is help? And it's almost like in that scenario, it's like you're going to a a, a fast food place and you're ordering, instead of ordering the McHappy meal, you're ordering, I want fries, then I want the nuggets, then I want the, the cheeseburger, then I want the soda. 
and you're not seeing it as a whole and certainly not as a process that a take could take a few months to get going and is going to need tweaking every once in a while to maintain and actually improve your business and help you consolidate overhead, expand into new markets and so on and grow with the, the, the business entity as it does. So the big takeaway is it's a process, not an item. And I, and if I sound passionate about it, it's because it's something I hear every single day, literally Mm -hmm. how much, how long does it take? Um, why is my free DIY site not making my phone ring? Why am mm -hmm. I not getting any emails? And, and the other point that I would say is if you work with an experienced professional, expect, plan for, anticipate, and want specific uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, there's... Um, Oh, what is that site? Catch a fire yep. and tap root. And I've actually volunteered on those sites several times. And I've actually, you know, tried to work with several nonprofits and there was a, a government organization I volunteered to help. I said, you know, I love the cause that you do. Um, I'll create a beautiful custom site for you if you let me. Mm -hmm. And I based my design on research conducted by Stanford University's Persuasive Technology Laboratory. So this is not, you know, how is design decided upon? Everything should be based on science and experience. And long story short, there were just, there was just so much um, interdepartmental uh, issues um, and confusion with the board of directors that hadn't been worked out before. And it went from being, you know, a small project to now we're talking 200 pages mm -hmm. and you need a newsletter, but you also need a download PDF format, annual reports, a password protected section. You want donations accepted, which is ideal, but it has to be through this specific uh, protocol, not through this and on and on. And I just said, I'm not getting paid for this. Right. This At what point is this not smart for me? You know, I offered to do it for you according to these criteria so I could get it done quickly and then move on. You got to let me do what I can do. Um, and then conversely, there was another nonprofit that I worked with where I, it was a nonprofit to help disabled homeless veterans, which I think is a wonderful cause that, you know, touches my heart. And I said, look, I can make you number one at Google for this. Are you ready for that? Mm -hmm. And you know what happened? Yep. As soon as the site went live, the person in charge started emailing me and saying, we're getting phone calls. What do we do? <laughs> People want to donate money, but our bank account is not set up as a 501c3. Right. And I said, well, you better explain that to the IRS because they will audit you, especially if you're new. You know, I was audited every year that my nonprofit functioned mm. and we barely made anything. Um, you know, and that's one of the reasons I discontinued it because I'm, you know, look, this is not about, you know, profit. This is about doing something I enjoy doing and helping mm -hmm. people as an ancillary offering here. You're getting audited every time, you know, annually on a regular recurring basis. It's not fun. No. And I think you're talking about something that's sort of universal to the nonprofit sector on the whole, at least on the most part. Most people most people start working in the nonprofit world out of out of pure passion yeah, and, yeah. and fail to take a look at the actual business practices that need to temper their passion and in order to make things run properly. Yeah. Um, and and I'm trying to to go through you know different points uh briskly. But and and again with score, which is you know, mm -hmm. pre pretty well, you know, been around since at least 50 years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and as a, as a mentor for them, uh, I must have gotten hundreds of phone calls in, in emails uh, from nonprofits, for profits, entrepreneurs, CEOs, retiring. And the, the, the common threads were, again, if you're going to use marketing, what for, you know, the idea is to get more phone calls to make more money. And um, like you said, with most NPOs, the board of the, the, the people at the top of the food chain of the hierarchy are get, are collecting salaries, but marketing is an afterthought. 
what you're going to do, how we're going to brand ourselves, all of that is after the NPO is already established. Now we have to go back and rebuild the site, rebrand all the marketing. So it's really about seeing things as a process, I think, and then putting things in respective order. So when I work with clients now, I always say, look, I'll talk to you a couple of times to see if we're a good fit. Then I want you to do a workbook. Mm -hmm. And 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 the resistance sometimes, well, it's, I'm not a child. No, I never said you were, Mm -hmm. but I want you to do a workbook anyway. Mm -hmm. You know, because we need to put things in the proper perspective and order in order Mm -hmm. to get things uh, accomplished. So it forces the individual to take a look at their passions from a more strategic point of view. Absolutely. Because like I said at the beginning, if you want a website, why? I mean, as simple a question as it is, it's also profound to a lot of people. If you want a nonprofit and you want to start one, why? Mm -hmm. Is it to appease your ego? Is it because you feel guilty and want to right some kind of wrong? Or is it because you, you know, you legitimately, you want to make a difference in the community? Well, if that's the case, all the more reason to be organized and very deliberate Mm -hmm. in, in what you do and how you do it, because you're not going to, you may not get a second chance. Right. You know, and, and bankruptcy court, uh, letting people go, you know, deleting your site because you're not getting anywhere with it. That's just, you know, let's, let's succeed. You know, let's just get things done the right way. So I'm very, very blessed that I'm semi-retired now. (laughs) Um, and, and I can pick and choose who I work with, but, um, I, I don't, I, I want to knock it out of the park. Yeah. For, so I always tell everybody, we got to slow things down and focus on achieving real goals. And I think part of the disconnect is seeing how can digital marketing, which is an intangible, you know, like growth, you know, how can, how can digital marketing help me really get more phone calls? There was a question I answered on Quora the other day, how can SEO, which is search engine optimization, which is how you outrank competitors in Google. How can that actually make my phone ring and make more money? Mm-hmm. So it's like, well, let's put things in order. And and then you can very plainly see how one thing leads to another. Mm-hmm. Which sort of leads me to the next question, which is, you know, you, you take the average nonprofit and a lot of nonprofits do the business case well. They they have the, the business plan down yes. um, and you have, you know, hopefully a good room of volunteer board members that know their stuff. W- once they start to get to the point where they look at their digital assets, you know, their website, their social media presence, are there any elements of that that they should be sure to include or should be sure yes. to avoid? Yeah. And let me tell you, it's actually the answer was in your question, Mm -hmm. because what you said, let's look at the website. Now let's look at the social media. Now let's look at the SEO. Now let's look at the content. Content is still king because Google indexes hello text. Google looks for links to scholarly authoritative blogs. So you really can't have one without the other. So a lot of people will go to Wix or Weebly or Squarespace or they'll work with a neighborhood hobbyist guy, which is fine if it's a hobby. But for a legitimate nonprofit organization, you need income. You need money coming in to in order to, to market the business and grow. And um, you, you got to see it as a, as a process. Again, so very, very uh, – as quickly as I can say it, if you visualize a website is what it used to be called a portal. Mm -hmm. They used to call websites portals. And the reason for that is because technically everything goes through the company website. So employees should have a place that they go to log in, to download HR forms. I knew a restaurant owner who used the um, employee portal for the the employees to log in and actually clock in once they got to the restaurant because it would track the IP address. Mm-hmm. 
So his employees would come to work and log in on the company website, download their paycheck uh, or their, the you know, the pay stub, the HR forms, the benefits information. The employees were actually allowed to have like a blog. They were encouraged because it would it would decrease turnover if employees could get involved and write about new recipes or, or programs they're doing, how they're doing in college, whatever. And it made people want to go to the website to learn more about the, the staff. And there are some NPOs that actually do do that. So my point is that the website should be seen as a portal through which the content, the SEO, the e-commerce, so you can process payments for services or goods or downloads or for events or for reservations or what have you. All of that should funnel through the website. Mm -hmm. So not taken piecemeal bit by bit, but as a single whole. So my advice is to either work with an agency, which is more costly, or find an experienced professional who you can work with and just say, look, we want to start and build a foundation on this. We want to achieve specific objectives. We want to achieve specific metrics that are realistic. And we, we're really serious about this. This is not a hobby for us. How can we best set this up? How does budgeting work if we don't know? And honestly, most nonprofits know intellectually how to budget, but I think they try to get deals. Mm-hmm. To, and it's chopping off your nose to spite your face. Mm-hmm. If you want to, and I want to say this very quickly because I hear the the question about money and price every day. Like I said, if you want to put an ad in a newspaper, it's not a hundred dollars. Mm-hmm. It's not free because they're not running a charity. They're running a, a legitimate profit driven business, mm-hmm. just as everybody else is, except the NPO. Mm-hmm. So, how do you budget for digital marketing that will achieve specific results? just as you would for putting an ad in a newspaper or putting an ad on radio or putting an ad on the side of a bus. The more people you want to reach, the more money you need to bring in, the greater your budget should be. Mm -hmm. So to put an ad in a local newspaper, last I checked, it was around at least three grand Mm -hmm. or they wouldn't talk to you. And this was probably five, 10 years ago. So I don't know what it is now, but if you want to put an ad in a newspaper, that's usually how it works. And after you stop paying, the phone calls stop. And if you ask the newspaper, can you guarantee results? They'll tell you, of course not. Right. So the asset, the, the value in digital marketing is in many cases, yeah, we can guarantee results. We can actually look in under the hood, so to speak, and look at Google Analytics, and we can tell you who's visiting your website, what time, from what country, from what city, what they're looking at, what they're going to. We can measure how many downloads you're getting. You And when I work with clients, I guarantee them within certain realistic you know, limits. Um, but also, the differences with digital marketing is when you stop paying, like the project for the most part is over. Now we're going to switch into a, an ongoing maintenance plan to make sure everything is kept up well. Mm-hmm. That's like a quarter of that amount. And you're always going to get results. So it continues indefinitely over the course of how we're, you know, the lifetime of the NPO. Mm-hmm. So the ROI is much, much greater. And that's why most newspapers today in 2019 are actually going under because they don't know how to compete against news, you know, uh, Google and LinkedIn and Facebook. So very few people actually advertise in newspapers anymore for that reason. Right. You know, if you want to put an ad in the Yellow Pages today, 2019, I think it's like 500 a month or something, depending on where you live. My which is which is insane, because who who uses them anymore? I can't even get one. Hmm. Yeah, I you know I have these little local <laughs> yellow pages things showing up on my doorstep from time to time, and yeah, I can't remember the last time I've ever used it. Yeah, and they're like half the size of what they used to be. Mm-hmm. Now, if you can get one, if you can find one, you use it to you know change a light bulb or something, you know. Um, 
or, or you know, or you get, I would give it to my, my pet rabbit to play with, but <laughs> you don't use it to look anything up because it's just so inefficient. You take out your phone and you look it up in Google. So this derails the conversation for a quick second here, but why doesn't the Yellow Pages companies, why don't those publishers actually just start distributing CDs instead of paper books? Well, for one thing, nobody uses CD anymore, really. That's I mean, a good point. <laughs> I mean, if I gave you a CD, what would you, you know, you might use it for Frisbee or something, <laughs> you know, um, and really quite honestly, giving out business cards, I just tell everybody DMS.blue. Yeah. I mean, how hard is that to remember? You either want to or you don't. But the Yellow Pages, it's just like all these other companies that unfortunately just do not know how to innovate. They're right. so big, they just can't pivot. Mm -hmm. And you see that going on. Uh, they call it the retail apocalypse, uh, the number of small businesses going under uh, in large retail outlets. We all have a retail outlet, outlet that we like that's going under, you know, Sears, um, you know, Kmart, uh, Walmart is still doing well, but certainly not at the rate that Amazon is. And they just, they don't know how to compete. They're not the way that Amazon is. And it's so simple. Mm -hmm. If I go to walmart.com, I can't find half of the items that I can find on Amazon or eBay, which is pretty sad because they've mm -hmm. got the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's a long winded response because I'm very passionate about it. But yeah, it's, it's embracing the new technology, uh, which really isn't that new at this point. But it's not it, it hasn't been around for a complete generation yet. So a lot of people my age or older might feel like, look, we didn't ask for the internet. We don't necessarily want it. We don't know how to deal with it, but they all use it to pay their bills and look things up. So it's a, a disconnect there. Mm -hmm. um, and you just have to look at it as, look, it's not a fad. Um, it's not going away. If anything, it's going to increase more and more as retail, as we know it, basically disappears very mm -hmm. slowly. You know, pay less shoes. I used to love them. And they declared bankruptcy. Sears declared bankruptcy. Um you know, I know Barnes and Noble, which I love, has, you know, changed hands uh, in ownership, you know, like several times. And there's several other big, huge, big box stores that are going to go under soon. Mm -hmm. um, they just they don't know how to innovate, you know. Right. I mean, you know, it's just it, it, it's, it, it's very sad. Yeah. It seems like the next real money makers are the folks who can actually do delivery better. Right. And then if you look yeah. at Walmart, every city has a Walmart. Mm -hmm. Why can't they deliver? Well, it's because they don't want to or they don't see the value in it. And yet they could easily partner with Uber or Lyft or what have you and do the exact same thing that Amazon does. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the same Toys R Us. Where are they now? Bankruptcy court. And they could have done the same thing. Every city had a Toys R Us, but they just could not or didn't want to pivot. Or maybe they thought they didn't have to. This is really excellent stuff, and I think I fear we're running out of time. Um, could we could we turn around and do another quick episode to drill down to some of the more specifics? And I sure, mean, I guess we we can't get too specific just because of our time frame. But uh, but if we could talk about more of the how to or what to do element sure. for nonprofits, I think that would be pretty valuable. I'm, I'm ready to go. I've had my caffeine. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, David, this has been a real pleasure, and I'm, and I'm glad you could join us for this, um, for this episode of the Nonprofit Snapcast. If it were appropriate, how would a listener contact you? Um, absolutely. All you got to do is go to that little white bar in Google and type in dms.blue. It's a real website domain. And um, dms.blue, you can put the www in front of it if you want to, but you don't need to. dms.blue, um, you can call me, my office rather, at 424-DAVID-01. And I'm always happy to help out and start a conversation. Thank you, David. That's great. You're actually making me jealous. I want a personalized phone number as well. <laughs> okay, we'll hook you up. We'll hook you great. up in, uh, in the next conversation. Thank Every you. NPO should have one. We should, everybody should have one. That's right. Yeah. Um, 
Uh, so again, to our listeners, thank you for joining us for this episode of the Nonprofit Snapcast. Join us next week when we continue this conversation with David Summerfleck and talk a little bit more about digital marketing and some of the more specific things nonprofits should be looking to do in their strategies. This has been the Snapcast. Thank you for joining us. Let's change the world together. Welcome to the Snapcast, the podcast for all nonprofit professionals, bringing you interviews and amazing ideas for nonprofit leaders. This is Mickey Desai, and welcome to the Nonprofit Snapcast. Today, I'm lucky to have with me David Summerfleck, who is a digital marketing specialist out in my old stomping grounds of Denver, Colorado. David has done a, a lot of stuff in the digital marketing world uh, since the internet basically was web version one. Am I right, David? Yes, that's correct. And yeah. you've, you've got quite a, a, quite a resume, if I'm reading things correctly. Are there any highlights that stand out to you amongst your history? Um. I mean, there's really not a single one that is the best. It's more of a cumulative effect, Mm -hmm. you know, of of all the years and basically since the mid 90s to the present, so much that I I learned and accumulated. Um, I was a business mentor for SCORE, which is a a well-known division of the United States Small Business Administration. I was a mentor for small business owners for approximately 10 years off and on while I was working for different agencies and until the point where I'm at now where I'm kind of semi-retired and I've tried to focus more on writing and kind of slowing things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. What kinds of things are you writing about? I'm working on a book uh, actually about digital marketing, big surprise. basically to try to break down digital marketing and talk about it from the perspective of I've noticed so many people tend to focus on price over value on tools over objectives. So I wanted to write something that would have almost very minimal technical jargon, but would focus more on, you know, let's put, things in the right perspective and in, in the right order in order to achieve what we want. Mm-hmm. Nobody wakes up in the middle of the night thinking, I need a website so you know it'll solve all my problems. They wake up in the middle of the night saying, I can't pay my mortgage, I can't pay my rent, my nonprofit organization can't get sufficient donors, we're going to go under. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the book and basically what I do, what I'm most passionate about is trying to get people to look at this in terms of let's solve problems and not talk about plugins and widgets and apps and, and you know, how much can I get this for? Why is my free Wix website not delivering the phone calls I thought it would? Well, it's not mm-hmm. meant to do that. Mm-hmm. So I want to kind of change the discourse to talking about value and achieving real tangible objectives for a nonprofit you need to get more donors you need money and it's a profound disconnect that i see in a lot of new startups in a lot of new uh nonprofit entities you know well, we don't really need money or it's just we want to help people and that's gold and that's beautiful but i've been there and i started a nonprofit like that and it lasted about three years mm-hmm. and it was just stress and anguish because I didn't put things in the right order. I had a beautiful custom website. I was number one in Google for what I was doing locally, Mm -hmm. but I didn't have the offline connections. I didn't have the connections with the court systems that I needed. So even though I was ready to rock and roll, it was just one phone call every, every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Just not enough to sustain any business. So that that's what the book is about, which is a mm-hmm. long-winded answer. So I'm just trying to be quick about it. Sure. No, and I think lessons being learned, I think that's a good segue into the topic I thought we would, would cover today, which is which is what does the average nonprofit need to know about how to how to properly do digital marketing? Oh boy. Uh without getting into real specifics and talking tech. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, which really isn't relevant, you know, um, what the nonprofit needs to know is that first of all, it's a process, not an item. And that may seem like a no brainer to some people listening or to yourself. It may seem like, you know, Hey, no kidding. But 
that's usually the dialogue starts at how much is a website, how much is SEO, how much is e-commerce I can properly accept donations, how much is help. And it's almost like in that scenario, it's like you're going to a, a, a fast food place and you're ordering, instead of ordering the McHappy meal, you're ordering, I want fries, then I want the nuggets, then I want the, the cheeseburger, then I want the soda. And you're not seeing it as a whole and certainly not as a process that a take could take a few months to get going and is going to need tweaking every once in a while to maintain and actually improve your business and help you consolidate overhead, expand into new markets, and so on and grow with the, the, the business entity as it does. So the big takeaway is it's a process, not an item. And, I, and if I sound passionate about it, it's because it's something I hear every single day, literally. Mm -hmm. How much... How long does it take? Um, why is my free DIY site not making my phone ring? Why am mm -hmm. I not getting any emails? And, and the other point that I would say is if you work with an experienced professional, expect, plan for, anticipate, and want specific uh, objectives. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, there's... Um, Oh, what is that site? Catch a fire yep. and tap root. And I've actually volunteered on those sites several times. And I've actually, you know, tried to work with several nonprofits. And there was a, a government organization I volunteered to help. I said, you know, I love the cause that you do. Um, I'll create a beautiful custom site for you if you let me. Mm -hmm. And I based my design on research conducted by Stanford University's Persuasive Technology Laboratory. So this is not, you know, how is design decided upon? Everything should be based on science and experience. And long story short, there were just, there was just so much um, interdepartmental uh, issues um, and confusion with the board of directors that hadn't been worked out before. And it went from being, you know, a small project to now we're talking 200 pages mm -hmm. and you need a newsletter, but you also need a download PDF format, annual reports, a password protected section. You want donations accepted, which is ideal, but it has to be through this specific uh, protocol, not through this and on and on. And I just said, I'm not getting paid for this. Right. This At what point is this not smart for me? You know, I offered to do it for you according to these criteria so I could get it done quickly and then move on. You got to let me do what I can do. Um, and then conversely, there was another nonprofit that I worked with where I, it was a nonprofit to help disabled homeless veterans, which I think is a wonderful cause that, you know, touches my heart. And I said, look, I can make you number one at Google for this. Are you ready for that? Mm -hmm. And you know what happened? Yep. As soon as the site went live, the person in charge started emailing me and saying, we're getting phone calls. What do we do? <laughs> People want to donate money, but our bank account is not set up as a 501c3. Right. And I said, well, you better explain that to the IRS because they will audit you, especially if you're new. You know, I was audited every year that my nonprofit functioned mm. and we barely made anything. Um, uh, you know, and that's one of the reasons I discontinued it because I'm, you know, look, this is not about, you know, profit. This is about doing something I enjoy doing and helping mm -hmm. people as an ancillary offering here. You're getting audited every time, you know, annually on a regular recurring basis. It's not fun. No. And I think you're talking about something that's sort of universal to the nonprofit sector on the whole, at least on the most part. Most people most people start working in the nonprofit world out of out of pure passion yeah, and, yeah. and fail to take a look at the actual business practices that need to temper their passion and in order to make things run properly. Yeah. Um, and and I'm trying to to go through you know different points uh briskly. But and, and again with score, which is you know, mm -hmm. pretty, pretty well, you know, been around since at least 50 years, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and as a, as a mentor for them, uh, I must have gotten hundreds of phone calls in, in emails uh, from nonprofits, for profits, entrepreneurs, CEOs, retiring. And the, 
the, the common threads were, again, if you're going to use marketing, what for? You know, the idea is to get more phone calls to make more money. And um, like you said, with most NPOs, the board of the 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 people at the top of the food chain of the hierarchy are get are collecting salaries, but marketing is an afterthought. What you're going to do, how we're going to brand ourselves, all of that is after the NPO is already established. Now we have to go back and rebuild the site, rebrand all the marketing. So it's really about seeing things as a process, I think, and then putting things in respective order. So when I work with clients now, I always say, look, I'll talk to you a couple of times to see if we're a good fit. Then I want you to do a workbook. Mm -hmm. and, and, they're, and they're resistant sometimes. Well, it's, I'm not a child. No, I never said you were, mm -hmm. but I want you to do a workbook anyway. Mm-hmm. You know, because we need to put things in the proper perspective and order in order mm -hmm. to get things uh, accomplished. You so know. it forces the individual to take a look at their passions from a more strategic point of view. Absolutely. Because, like I said at the beginning, if you want a website, why? I mean, as simple a question as it is, it's also profound to a lot of people. If you want a nonprofit and you want to start one, why? Mm -hmm. Is it to appease your ego? Is it because you feel guilty and want to right some kind of wrong? Or is it because you, you know, you legitimately, you want to make a difference in the community? Well, if that's the case, all the more reason to be organized and very deliberate mm -hmm. in, in what you do and how you do it, because you're not going to, you may not get a second chance. Right. You know, in, in bankruptcy court, uh, letting people go you know, deleting your site because you're not getting anywhere with it. That's just, you know, let's, let's succeed. You know, let's just get things done the right way. So I'm very, very blessed that I'm semi-retired now. <laughs> um, and, and I can pick and choose who I work with, but, um, I, I, I don't, I, I want to knock it out of the park. Yeah. For, so I always tell everybody, we got to slow things down and focus on achieving real goals. And I think part of the disconnect is seeing how can digital marketing, which is an intangible, you know, like growth, you know, how can, how can digital marketing help me really get more phone calls? There was a question I answered on Quora the other day, how can SEO, which is search engine optimization, which is how you outrank competitors in Google, how can that actually make my phone ring and make more money? Mm -hmm. So it's like, well, let's put things in order. And, and then you can very plainly see how one thing leads to another. Mm -hmm. Which sort of leads me to the next question, which is, you know, you, you take the average nonprofit and a lot of nonprofits do the business case. Well, they, they have the, the business plan down yes. um, and you have, you know, hopefully a good room of, volunteer board members that know their stuff, once they start to get to the point where they look at their digital assets, you know, their website, their social media presence, are there any elements of that that they should be sure to include or should be sure yes. to avoid? Yeah. And mm -hmm. let me tell you, it's it, actually the answer was in your question mm -hmm. because what you said, let's look at the website. Now let's look at the social media. Now let's look at the SEO. Now let's look at the content content is still king because Google indexes hello text. Google looks for links to scholarly authoritative blogs. So you really can't have one without the other. So a lot of people will go to Wix or Weebly or Squarespace, or they'll work with a neighborhood hobbyist guy, which is fine if it's a hobby. But for a legitimate nonprofit organization, you need income. You need money coming in to in order to to market the business and grow. And um, you got to see it as a, as a process again. So very, very uh, as quickly as I can say it, if you visualize a website is what it used to be called a portal. Mm -hmm. They used to call websites portals. And the reason for that is because technically everything goes through the company website. So employees should have 
a place that they go to log in to download HR forms. I knew a restaurant owner who used the um, employee portal for the, the employees to log in and actually clock in once they got to the restaurant because it would track the IP address. Mm-hmm. So his employees would come to work and log in on the company website, download their paycheck uh, or their, the, you know, the pay stub, the HR forms, the benefits information. The employees were actually allowed to have like a blog. They were encouraged because it would, it would decrease turnover if employees could get involved and write about new recipes or, or programs they're doing, how they're doing in college, whatever. And it made people want to go to the website to learn more about the, the staff. And there are some NPOs that actually do do that. So my point is that the website should be seen as a portal through which the content, the SEO, the e-commerce, so you can process payments for services or goods or downloads or for events or for reservations or what have you. All of that should funnel through the website. Mm-hmm. So not taken piecemeal bit by bit, but as a single whole. So my advice is to either work with an agency, which is more costly, or find an experienced professional who you can work with and just say, look, we want to start and build a foundation on this. We want to achieve specific objectives. We want to achieve specific metrics that are realistic and we, we're really serious about this. This is not a hobby for us. How can we best set this up? How does budgeting work if we don't know? And honestly, most nonprofits know intellectually how to budget, but I think they try to get deals. Mm-hmm. To, and it's chopping off your nose despite your face. Mm-hmm. If you want to, and I want to say this very quickly because I hear the the question about money and price every day. Like I said. If you want to put an ad in a newspaper, it's not a hundred dollars. It's not free because they're not running a charity. They're running a a legitimate profit driven business Mm -hmm. just as everybody else is except the NPO. Mm -hmm. So how do you budget for digital marketing that will achieve specific results just as you would for putting an ad in a newspaper or putting an ad on radio or putting an ad on the side of a bus? The more people you want to reach, the more money you need to bring in, the greater your budget should be. Mm -hmm. So to put an ad in a local newspaper last I checked, it was around at least three grand. Mm -hmm. Or they wouldn't talk to you. And this was probably five, ten years ago. So I don't know what it is now, but if you want to put an ad in a newspaper, that's usually how it works. And after you stop paying the phone calls stop. And if you ask the newspaper, can you guarantee results? They'll tell you, of course not. Right. So the asset, the the value in digital marketing is in many cases, yeah, we can guarantee results. We can actually look in under the hood, so to speak, and look at Google Analytics and we can tell you who's visiting your website, what time, from what country, from what city, what they're looking at, what they're going to. We can measure how many downloads you're getting. You And when I work with clients, I guarantee them within certain realistic you know, limits. Um, but also the differences with digital marketing is when you stop paying, like the project for the most part is over. Now we're going to switch into a, an ongoing maintenance plan to make sure everything is kept up well. Mm -hmm. that's like a quarter of that amount and you're always going to get results. So it continues indefinitely over the course of how, you know, the lifetime of the NPO. Mm -hmm. So the ROI is much, much greater. And that's why most newspapers today in 2019 are actually going under because they don't know how to compete against news, you know, uh, Google and LinkedIn and mm-hmm. Facebook. So very few people actually advertise in newspapers anymore for that reason. Right. You know, if you want to put an ad in the yellow pages today, 2019, I think it's like 500 a month or something, depending on where you live. My goodness. Which is, which is insane. Because who, who uses them anymore? I can't even get one. Hmm. Yeah. I, you know, I have these little local <laughs> yellow pages things showing up on my doorstep from time to time and 
Yeah. I and can't remember the last time I've ever used it. Yeah. And they're like half the size of what they used to be. Mm-hmm. Now, if you can get one, if you can find one, you use it to, you know, change a light bulb or something, you know, um, or, or, you know, or you get, I would give it to my, my pet rabbit to play with, but you don't use it to look anything up because it's just so inefficient. You take out your phone and you look it up in Google. So this derails the conversation for a quick second here, but why doesn't the Yellow Pages companies, why don't those publishers actually just start distributing CDs instead of paper books? Well, for one thing, nobody uses CD anymore, really. That's I mean, a good point. <laughs> I mean, if I gave you a CD, what would you, you know, you might use it for a Frisbee or something, <laughs> you know, um, and really, quite honestly, giving out business cards, I just tell everybody DMS.blue. Yeah. I mean, how hard is that to remember? You either want to or you don't. But the Yellow Pages, it's just like all these other companies that unfortunately just do not know how to innovate. They're right. so big, they just can't pivot. And you see that going on. Uh, they call it the retail apocalypse, uh, the number of small businesses going under who, uh, in large retail outlets. We all have a retail outlet, outlet that we like that's going under, you know, Sears, um, you know, Kmart, uh, Walmart is still doing well, but certainly not at the rate that Amazon is. And they just, they don't know how to compete. Not the way that Amazon is. And it's so simple. Mm -hmm. If I go to walmart.com, I can't find half of the items that I can find on Amazon or eBay, which is pretty sad because they've Mm -hmm. got the infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So it's a long winded response because I'm very passionate about it. But yeah, it's it's embracing the new technology, uh, which really isn't that new at this point. But it's not; it, it hasn't been around for a complete generation yet. So a lot of people my age or older might feel like, look, we didn't ask for the internet. We don't necessarily want it. We don't know how to deal with it. But they all use it to pay their bills and look things up. So it's a, a, a disconnect there. Mm-hmm. Um, and you just have to look at it as, look, it's not a fad. Um, it's not going away. If anything, it's going to increase more and more as retail, as we know it, basically disappears very mm-hmm. slowly. You know, pay less shoes. I used to love them. And they declared bankruptcy. Sears declared bankruptcy. Um, you know, I know Barnes & Noble, which I love, has, you know, changed hands uh, in ownership, you know, like, several times and there's several other big huge big box stores that are going to go under soon mm-hmm. uh, they just they don't know how to innovate you know right i mean you know it's just it, it's, it's it's very sad yeah it seems like the next real money makers are the folks who can actually do delivery better right and then if you yeah. look at walmart every city has a walmart mm-hmm. why can't they deliver well, it's because they don't want to or they don't see the value in it. And yet they could easily partner with Uber or Lyft or what have you and do the exact same thing that Amazon does. Mm-hmm. I mean, the, the same Toys R Us, where are they now? Bankruptcy court. And they could have done the same thing. Every city had a Toys R Us, but they just could not or didn't want to pivot. Or maybe they thought they didn't have to. This is really excellent stuff, and I think I fear we're running out of time. Um, could we could we turn around and do another quick episode to drill down to some of the more specifics? And I sure, mean, I guess we we can't get too specific just because of our time frame. But uh, but if we could talk about more of the how to or what to do elements sure. for nonprofits, I think that would be pretty valuable. I'm I'm ready to go. I've had my caffeine. I'm ready. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, David, this has been a real pleasure, and I'm and I'm glad you could join us for this um, for this episode of the Nonprofit Snapcast. If it were appropriate, how would a listener contact you? Um, absolutely. All you got to do is go to that little white bar in Google and type in DMS dot blue. It's a real website domain, and um, DMS dot blue. You can put the www in front of it if you want to, but you don't need to. DMS dot blue. Um, you can call me my office rather at 424 David zero one. And I'm always happy to help out and start a conversation.
Thank you, David. That's great. You're actually making me jealous. I want a personalized phone number as well. <laughs> okay, we'll hook you up. We'll hook you great. up in the, in the next conversation. Thank Every you. NPO should have one. We should. Every should have one. That's right. Yeah. Um, uh, so again, to our listeners, thank you for joining us with this episode of the Nonprofit Snapcast. Join us next week when we continue this conversation with David Summerfleck and talk a little bit more about digital marketing and some of the more specific things nonprofits should be looking to do in their strategies. This has been the Snapcast. Thank you for joining us. Let's change the world together. Welcome to the Snapcast, the podcast for all nonprofit professionals, bringing you interviews and amazing ideas for nonprofit leaders. Hello again, this is Mickey Desai, still on the line with our friend David Summerfleck. David, uh, we were talking about digital marketing strategies for nonprofits and and you know how to not be overridden by just passion, how to apply a real strategy to the overall um, needs and to-do list for digital marketing for nonprofits in general. And can we continue that conversation and, 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 and what can we tell nonprofits about how to more properly and effectively document their digital marketing strategies. Right. Well, first of all, thank you for, for having me back. Um, the first thing I want to say is that passion is great. Okay. Nobody needs to, you know, uh, not have passion. Passion is what, what, what brought me to the dance. And, and anybody listening to me can, can clearly discern that in my voice and what I write, what I do, everything. Um, but it needs to have some structure to it. It needs to have an organization just like the NPO. I mean, you can't just start an NPO and say, we want to help this group of, of, of people or this underserved population, and we're going to do it through telepathy. How are you going to reach them? So uh, passion is, is a wonderful thing, but it needs to have an organized, very deliberate, focused structure. And that digital marketing is a means to an end. It basically uses the company website, the search engine optimization, the social media, the well-written content, the branding, the direction, and all of that together as a collective whole. So there's no disconnect. And, and whoever any organization works with, the the person you work with should have a, a passion and want to be able to bring all of these different tools together in order to achieve a larger business objective, mm -hmm. which could be the nonprofit reaching more of this particular type of disenfranchised group or population in need. Because at the end of the day, they're counting on you, whether they're animals who are beaten and abused or homeless veterans, or 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 you know uh, single mothers, they're counting on you, and you say you care, right? So this is where the rubber meets the road. It behooves you to slow your roll and say, look, I value this cause sufficiently that I'm going to take it seriously and put on my my big boy or my big girl pants here, and not look for how can I get a free website, how cheap can I get this, how much, how much. Instead, focusing in on how can I achieve this objective of getting 30 new subscribers per month or increasing my donorship so I can get the five grand per month that I need minimally in order to function and grow? Mm -hmm. Or how can I solicit more volunteers or have people coming to a, non a nonprofit event? So you need to work with someone who knows what they're doing mm -hmm. as opposed to someone who's struggling to survive and is going to say, sure, I'll build you a website for $20 or I'll do it for free so I can put it in my portfolio because I have no experience. That doesn't serve the ends. So you're saying there's really not a solid way to DIY your way through this, is there? DIY doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying it because of what I do or because I want money. I don't. I have a host, I'm, I'm happily married, I'm semi-retired. If I don't work with another client again, I'll miss the work. Mm -hmm. But I can sit back and work on novels and screenplays and, and go sit with my rabbit and, and, and chase after my wife and do whatever she tells me to do. So my point is that, yeah, you've got to have things in a structured order. And... Um, it hit me with that original question again. I got sidetracked. 
you, there's no good way to DIY. Yeah, the strategy yeah. I've there. never seen it work. Mm -hmm. I've never seen it work. I've, I mean, as a certified business mentor for SCORE, where I was, I, I, I volunteered for them off and on for 10 years. I take a break for a couple months and I go back. Mm -hmm. I never talked to a single business owner yet in all that time. And in my 20 to 30 years in digital marketing, I never met one person yet who has a free or DIY website that actually attracted phone calls and made real tangible resources or money for them. Mm -hmm. It doesn't work, you know, um, and by its very nature, it doesn't. You can't start an NPO completely by yourself. At some point, you're going to need to talk to a lawyer or you're going to need to bring in a paid staff member. Or, you know, at some point, money's going to have to change hands or you just right. can't function. It just doesn't work. You know, on multiple levels, DIY doesn't work for the NPO or for any business entity. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. the dentist, the doctor, the lawyer, the mechanic, they don't DIY anything. They went right. to school to learn what they do. But I can just hear, like, uh, I can just imagine a particular person uh, that I'm thinking of, and I can't name names, obviously, but sure. they're going to say a dentist doesn't use a computer to work on my teeth. Whereas no, they I don't, but the staff yeah. does. The staff yeah. uses the computer and the website to log in and log out, and guess what? Attract you patient. Yeah. You know, there is, you know, there's actually, I had to get a, sur I had to have a, a hernia surgery and um, I read reviews online and the reviews were horrifying, right? So I looked up a hernia surgeon, of course, using Google, and I wanted to find the best hernia surgeon I could find. So I went to the guy who was number one in Google, number one. Mm -hmm. And I went to him, I said, I got to tell you, I've never seen a doctor in my life, never have such a beautiful website, have so many videos all over his site mm -hmm. and just really be on Instagram and Facebook and social media up and down, left and right, blog posts about procedures and what you should do to prepare in advance. But he said, well, that's why I'm number one in Google. Yeah. And, and guess what? That $5,000 I spent on the website, it brought me you. And guess how much your hernia surgery is going to be? <laughs> right. It ain't going to be five grand. I can tell you that. Because I'm the best there is at what I do. Right. And I charge, you know, 25, 30 grand. And thank God the benefits covered it. But you get my larger point. Yes. You know, um, and, I, and I'll tell you a real, another brief, brief example. There was a lawyer I spoke to a couple months ago. And she had called me and, and she said, you know, I'm a lawyer with two different areas of specialty, brilliant woman. I mean, imagine being a lawyer who practices in two different sections, the education required for that. I have the utmost respect for that. Now, at the time, my wife was going through cancer. So I was really, you know, stressed out and tired, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. So I'm talking to her in my office and I said, ma'am, look, you know, just tell me your situation. I'll answer any questions you want. And she said, well, I have a Wix website. I'm paying $2,000 a month with Google AdWords and I'm getting not a single phone call at all. And in a couple of months, I'm going to have to shut it down and go to Starbucks because I, I can't go on like this. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, look, I can explain to you why this isn't working. You know, I can explain to you that Wix is a DIY template. It's not real digital marketing. Pardon me for saying it. It's my opinion, but you know, it's based on 20 plus years experience. It's a template. And if you don't know what to program in and you don't know how to properly do it and what to add, it's not going to work for you. Mm -hmm. So I basically told her you're, you're putting good, you know, good money in front of bad money. You're never going to get anywhere with this. I can answer any technical questions you want and I'll be painfully honest with you because I don't really, you know, you're not going to work with me anyway, right. you know, and I'll tell you whatever you want to know. And at the end of the call, she said, I'm more confused than ever before. Huh. I don't know what I'm going to do. I guess I'll do nothing. And that's what she said. And I said, well, I'm sorry you feel that way. You know, God bless you. Have a good day. If you want to, you know, ask any other questions, I'll, I'll be available for you. But I can't make you do what you don't want to do. Right. You know, and that was it. But it was very sad again. But And just another indicator, DIY doesn't work because in order for you to add what you need for it to be listed at the top of Google, you have to already be an expert. 
and not only that exactly, but I'm thinking that a lot of nonprofit managers are are more inclined to spend their time on mission driven activities and than they are to. And they should be. Yeah, exactly. And and doing the doing and the social media, be, yeah. and exactly. digital media is a full time yeah. job. And, and, yeah, and it drives me nuts because yeah. it's like the hernia surgeon who charges twenty five or thirty grand per patient. Mm-hmm. He didn't try to build his own website so he could save a you know a few thousand dollars. What's five grand to him? Right. It's nothing when he's making you know eighty grand a day. Right. Or you know, or he sees the value in getting more leads. So if that means spending five thousand, so I can make thirty thousand back, five or six times a day, that's worth it. That's a great investment. And the funny thing is, he had there were no other hernia surgeons within that region who were number one or number two or number three in Google. You had to really look hard. And where I live in Southwest Florida, most doctors do not use SEO. So the only way to find them is to stop your car and, you know, go pick up their cards or look them up through the benefits uh, company. Mm -hmm. The same is true for lawyers uh, as well. So it's about what's the value of this to you. Right. So in – in addition to the recognition, or at least now that we've recognized that it takes uh, at least a part-time presence, if not a full-time presence, to properly run a digital marketing strategy, is what what's some of the preliminary work that a nonprofit can do to keep them at least on task? Is there like a playbook or um, absolutely, yeah? And, and where would a nonprofit find that information? Well, first of all, I want to any nonprofit organization listening, if you have specific questions. Please don't ask me how much is a website because I it basically it, it depends on what objectives you want to achieve. Mm-hmm. And it's about budgeting realistically. So you're not going to be number one at Google for two hundred dollars or for, you know, the cost of, you know, a, a meal out with friends. Right. It just doesn't work that way. And, and most people, most professional digital marketing specialists and web developers do care and they'll prorate things that will work with you realistically. Um, but you you got to know what you want before you begin. Know your market. Know, know your target audience. Know your demographics before you make the phone call, before you start looking. Um, and when you do look for that professional person, you want to look for experience, some credentials, you know, references, um, live sites that you can look at. And the most common mistake I see is people saying, I tried DIY, it's not getting me anywhere, everything should be free, I'm stuck in that circular mindset, I can't break free from it. Mm -hmm. Or I hired someone on Craigslist or Fiverr for $200 and I'm furious because I'm not getting the results that I want, will you fix my site? And I'll pay you $50 or something. And so it's like a shoestring circular approach again and it just doesn't work that way. You've got to think like an enterprise level um, organization in order to reach that. So it's kind of like breaking free from the poverty mindset that a lot of NPOs seem to subscribe to, or at least at that startup initiation phase where they're bootstrapping, which mm-hmm. I don't believe works either, to be honest with you. No, I have to agree with you there too. And that's that's a whole nother topic for another yeah. day. Yeah. Uh, business planning for nonprofits and uh, uh, yeah, yeah, uh, David, <laughs> yeah, and I've no. been there too. You know, <laughs> David, this has been great. And uh, once again, I'm afraid we're running out of time because there's just so much to talk about. Um, again, if a if a if an individual or a nonprofit wanted to be in touch with you for any reason, how would they do that? Absolutely, I'm always happy to answer questions that are serious and and, and purposeful. Uh, I'm not going to ignore that. So you can just go to, you know, Google or the address bar and just type in DMS dot blue or www.dms.blue, and you can call my office at 424-DAVID-01, and that is my Google Voice number. If you leave a message for me, I'll get it as an email, and I will text you back or or email you back and say, hey, I got your message. What can I do to help you? Fantastic. David, thank you for joining us on this episode of the Nonprofit Snapcast, and I, I hope we can do this again sometime in the future. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. 
And to our listeners, thank you for joining us. uh, And we will be back again in about a week. Hope you're having a good one.